All right. Um, I guess we'll just kick things off here. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. I'm Teddy Downey. I'm a, a CEO and executive editor at the Capital Forum. And we're really excited to have Luke Heron here today. Uh, he wrote, uh, I, I think, kind of like a landmark uh, academic study called The Law and Political Economy of a Student Debt Jubilee. And he released a paper this morning uh, called An Administrative Path to Student Debt Cancellation. Uh, as, as a follow-up, and uh, he's a PhD candidate in law at Yale Law School. He previously served as legal director of the Debt Collective, where he helped design the legal and organi organizing strategy that pressured the Department of Education to begin to cancel the debts of defrauded for-profit college students. He's worked at the Furman Center on Real Estate and Urban Policy, the CFPB, and the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. He clerked for the Honorable Rosemary Pooler on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and his JDs from uh, New York University School of Law. And uh, you know, just to kind of frame this, I mean, we're, you know, Capital Forum. We do a lot of uh, covering education policy and uh, the po politics and uh, I say this political economy of uh, you know student loans for a long time. And uh, this seems like a pretty, you know, it's a major uh, political issue in the next election. And I, I would just point everyone, I mean, I, I, I sent it, I mean, we kind of sent it back and forth uh, uh, over the weekend. This, this article in the Washington Post, eyeing populist challenge from the left, Trump seeks plan to tackle student debt. And basically just an article is Trump is nervous politically that, Warren and Sanders have these popular student debt cancellation policies and he's not doing anything about it and may suffer politically from that. And uh, But he has this awkward situation where he can't do anything because his uh, billionaire Department of Education person doesn't want to cancel any student debt and doesn't want to come up with a plan and he doesn't want to fire her because uh, she ha is a billionaire and has political influence in Michigan. So it's just this bizarre, it's like a Veep episode, I kind of think. But uh, it does kind of get to the, there's a huge political moment here uh, for this idea. And uh, so we're super thrilled to have Luke here and he's gonna talk about his paper, kind of give us an a intro to it and then I'll ask him some questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. So thanks, thanks Luke. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me, Teddy. Um, so I'll just like briefly summarize the argument. I don't know how familiar anyone is with the, with the nature of the argument. And then I think it's much easier to just do questions back and forth. And we can tease out what the nature of the argument is and what the potential um, snags might be. So the basic argument that I make is that the Department of Education, so, so the way I first came to this uh, uh, possibility is that I found that the Department of Education um, has this, there's a portion of the Higher Education Act that says that the secretary may, quote, compromise, waive, or release any title claim, et cetera. Um, basically, they can, you can compromise, this is usually referred to as a compromise and settlement authority. You can, because the Department of Education has authority over to collect student debt, it can, as a, as a litigator, as a sort of prosecutor, like the, Department of like the Department of Justice when it has a claim against private parties, it can make settlements with respect to those claims. Um, and uh, I first came about that authority thinking about how this could apply to um, for-profit college students, and in fact, other, others, including a, a couple of folks at the National Consumer Law Center, had done some thinking on that. Um, but then it occurred to me that uh, there's nothing cabining the application of this statute, um, and if the Secretary of Education decided if the political wind shifted such that it made sense for the Secretary of Education to use this authority to, to just not, to stop collecting on all or some broad swath, depending on what set of decisions, you know, s some set of criteria for determining who should, whose debt should be canceled, the Secretary of Education could just, um, could just do it. Um, so, so that's the very simple version of the argument, the like slightly more complicated set of steps, and then we can get, and then I'll get into a couple complications and how this would uh, have to be carried out is that, um, so uh, there's not, 
not surprisingly, there's not a lot of court cases determining how much a executive agency, certainly the Department of Education, but any executive agency can, how far they can go in using compromise and settlement authorities. Um, but uh, there's what I think is the relevant governing law comes from this case in 1985 called Heckler versus Cheney, um, in which the Supreme Court said that basically administrative agencies have prosecutorial discretion of the same nature as any other agent of the federal government who has the power to enforce federal claims, namely the Department of Justice, the, the Attorney General, um, is the sort of most obvious example of this. But any, any director of an administrative agency that's an agent of the federal government has discretion over claims. Um, and that discretion is absolute discretion. So similar to how a prosecutor can um, decline to prosecute uh, a crime, can decline to prosecute uh, a, a civil proceeding against any um, private party uh, uh, without the court, you know, the court can, in some given circumstances, there might be reasons that a court can review a settlement for some reason or another, a, a consent order, but dec decisions not to prosecute are not reviewable by courts. Um, except in the sort of case that there might be some sort of constitutional violation, that is to say that, it, that there's like a systematic policy of a prosecutor to, to not prosecute, you know, racially motivated crimes or something like that, although those are very, it's a very hard case to win. Um, so in any case, that, that set of precedents with respect to prosecutors basically applies to administrative agencies, and so the power, so, it, so in fact, under that line of precedence, you wouldn't even need this explicit authority to compromise ways and release, as long as you have the authority to enforce a statute, you have discretion over how you want to enforce that statute. Um, so that's like a slightly more complicated version of the argument. And, and the nature of the legal claim there is that it's not that um, a court, it's not that there's, a court can say like, well, this is a wise decision or a not wise decision, or you know, that the, the, it was a legitimate set of reasons that the Department of Education or a prosecutor um, uh, had for not not enforcing a claim, it's that the department of it, the the court has no authority to review any of the details unless there's some sort of claim of discrimination, some sort of claim of unconstitutionality. Um, so that is the basic th that's the basic legal argument, and then so then there's this question of well, okay, so how would that be? How would that actually have to be implemented? Um, and the without getting sort of too into the statutory details, there's three types of federal student loans as relevant for these purposes. There's what are called direct loans. There's FELP loans or family, the Federal Family Education Loan Program loans. And then there's Perkins loans. Um, uh, the great majority of federal student loans now are direct loans. Um, uh, all new student loans are, but the, the great majority of outstanding student loans, that is loans that are previously issued but are now being collected on, are direct student loans. I think it's something to the tune of 85%. I, I should go check that number, but um, that's what I remember. Uh, and um, so with respect to direct loans, the Department of Education already is, has a direct claim against students, and they can just not enforce that claim. There's an additional wrinkle there, which is that actually this compromise wave and settlement authority does not is not written into the direct loan statute, but it says that similar terms apply. We can get into that if you guys want. Um, uh, with respect to federal, to the FELP loans and Perkins loans though, the Department of Education does not directly issue those loans and does not collect those loans unless and until there's some problem, unless basically private guarantee agency, uh, private lenders or gar and guarantee agencies who guarantee the private lenders loans have trouble enforcing. But there's other ways for the department to get access to those loans. And so there would be some set of steps that the Department of Education would have to take in order to take possession of these loans that either private lenders or guarantee agencies have possession over. So the department couldn't just say, you know, private lender, you have to not collect on those loans. There would have to be some set of intermediate steps, as far as I can tell. Um, and then similarly for Perkins loans, Perkins loans are directly issued by schools themselves. Um, and so either the department would have to take possession of those loans or the department could create, could facilitate schools stopping to collect those loans. Perkins loans are something like, they're less than 1% of federal student loans and they're not a big source of revenue. In fact, I think there's a big source of burden for a lot of schools. So I actually think it wouldn't be too hard to convince a lot of schools to stop collecting on those loans as part of a broad program, especially if there was some sort of regulatory favors that came with it and we could, we could think creatively about what that would be. So that's the basic 
that, so that's like what the Department of Education would have to do in order to exercise that authority. And then there's a couple other wrinkles which I'll mention, and then we can talk about what other wrinkles you guys are interested in talking about. Um, so one wrinkle is um, the, um, well, you know, canceling a lot of student debt would have a big budgetary impact. Um, it would mean not collecting, not bringing in a lot of money. So there's a bunch of different statutes that pertain to when, who can make what sort of decisions about the budget. I think basically none of them apply because most like statutory paygo only applies to statutes and, you know, other, and the, you know, um, anti, um, uh, I forget the name of the statute, but anyway, there's a statute that says that the president has to spend money that's allocated and then can only spend, and can only spend the money that's been allocated. Um, and that I, I think that doesn't apply for a number of reasons we can talk about. But the one thing that does apply at the budgetary level is what's called administrative paygo. And I don't know what the different levels of expertise are here, but administrative paygo is something that was implemented by the Bush administration. It's a totally discretionary thing that the president can decide to, use, to implement or not implement. Um, so that should just be, I think it should just be eliminated, but to the extent that it still applies, the Office of Management and Budget would have to be consulted to determine that this amount, the amount of debt doesn't count against the baseline in some relevant way. And then finally, um, uh, the thing that always comes up when you talk about canceling debt is the tax implications, because as um, <laughs> lawyers who have been in this space will know, um, so there's something called the cancellation of indebtedness income doctrine, which says that if you if your debt is canceled, that can, in many circumstances, count as income, right? Because the equivalent is, you don't now that you don't have to pay that money back, the original money that you got is now a transfer to you, and so that, that now counts as income. Um, and uh, there are a number of exceptions to the cancellation of indebtedness rule, um, uh, some of which would, the degree to which they would apply would depend on the scope of debt cancellation. But the, the other thing that can be done is that the IRS can just say, oh, there's, some argu there's an arguable thing here. We don't have, we're just going to say that you don't have to, we're not going to tax this, and we're not going to require people to submit 1099s. And in fact, that's exactly what the IRS did in the case of um, for-profit college students who, had, who are starting to have their debts canceled under the Obama administration. Um, basically, so my understanding of the inside game of it, and I think this is actually now public information, is that um, the I, IRS was going to say, no, we're going to require debtors to submit 1099s, and we're going to determine like on a case-by-case -case basis whether they have to pay debt, they have to pay um, taxes on debt, debt that has been canceled, right? So in other words, they would, student loans would then turn into debt to the government in another form through tax, and there wouldn't be an installment plan, and there would be a lot of, you could get a tax lien against you, right? So that'd be very bad. Um, but um, basically, I think actually basically Elizabeth Warren convinced Obama not to do that um, uh, in some sort of dramatic Air Force One confrontation, uh, as, as I'm told. Um, and uh, and the, I, the, the, the reasoning that the IRS put out there was like, well, there's some reasons that this may or may not be cancellation of indebtedness income. And we're just not going to, we're not, like they didn't really have a reasoning for it. They were just like, well, okay, we're not going to, Go ahead on this. So go go ahead and cancel the debt. So I think something similar could apply in this case. Um, okay. So that's like a number of steps into the boring weeds. We can figure out how which weeds you guys are interested in and uh, and talk further. Okay. Perfect. So I think you know it's really interesting just the broadness in this case with the, the, explains the broadness of this prosecutorial discretion. Um, uh, that just, you know, it's basically like, look, you can just choose unilaterally you know, not to enforce something. Um, you know, the one, I, 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 I asked a couple uh, quick questions. Or, or, and with this, my basic operating thesis, I think, is the basic, is the main one. It kind of cuts the chase, which is, you know, you talk about the political benefit in the paper, the polling is good, there are these economic benefits uh, to of the presidential candidates have already said they're going to do it to some extent. Um, through Congress. They've said through Congress, yes. Um, and depending who you talk to, there's some willingness to explore your paper, or read your paper, or see how it goes. But let's say one of those people becomes president. What kind of pressure are we talking about? I mean, 
this seems like a pretty likely thing. I mean, it seems like, okay, you go, they become president, they try to get the legislation passed, they don't have the votes, and then there's this huge demand on them to do what you're advocating is legally an option for them. I mean, I would say it seems pretty likely that um, uh, this is going to happen if one of those president, uh, if, if one of those candidates becomes president, if Warren or Sanders becomes president. I know, it, it, but and and you've said, oh well, this is just a recent. You've just recently come out of this. So my question is, what is your, what's your response to that? And also, are you kind of like surprised at how quickly this has kind of become a big issue and and been taken up? So. Let's take the last question first. The answer is yes. I mean, when I first started, when I started, when I sat down to write this, so I had been thinking about this and researching this when I was fighting with the Department of Education. Um, and uh, but when I decided, well, I'll write, I'll write a law review article about it. The, the thought was that okay, well, I'll just like put this out there in the world, and you see how it trickles into the ether. And but like over the course of writing, the, like I started in May, I sat down to write and between that time and when I sort of like, you know, po posted it on the internet, uh, two candidates had now proposed that they were going to cancel student debt, right? And that, and that was like not at all a possibility. And, you know, Sanders in the 2016 election proposed to make college tuition free. He said nothing about canceling student debt, nothing at all, um, including not even for-profit college students. Um, and now that's like the conservative position to cancel debt for for-profit college students. Um, you know, Obama was opposed to that. I mean, he actively resisted that. Um, so, so that's, it's just been fascinating to see and it's like deeply gratifying to see. Um, and now these, these arguments have some purchase and have some relevance. Um, and so part of the, and part of the interesting thing about that is that, you know, when you make, the, the thing about legal arguments is that like, um, there's one sort of set of things which is like, well, does it, can you match it to the law and does it make sense? But there's another set of things which is like, or is anyone paying attention, like does anyone care? Because what would really have to happen in this case is that basically somebody in the administration would have to care and actually implement it. And so the, the, nat the sort of validity of the argument is not really going to be tested unless somebody cares enough to start trying it out and put some political pressure on. So anyway, that's, that's been an interesting set of dynamics. Um, with respect to the likelihood that this would be done by a president, I, I mean, I guess what I would say is you can't take for granted the fact that the movement's going to be there to, to put pressure on the president. I think, I mean... I've worked with folks who are doing the organizing, and like, there's a lot of great organizing out there, and hope, and and they're, I I know they have they have plans, um, but it's gotta, you know, the pressure has to exist, and also I think different different, uh, I mean, let me put it this way: although I think there is a good a clear legal path, and there's a good clear set of legal arguments to make, this is not an easy lift. This is, um, uh, you know moving into novel territory. There's surely going to be a court fight, even though I think there's a whole lot of reasons to think that it would be a, you know, a, a drawn out court fight that would be actually difficult for anyone to, it would be difficult to fight even a plaintiff. Um, but, you know, the other side's going to find a number, any way they can do to fight this. Um, so, so it's an expenditure of political capital, in other words, and there's a lot of things that people want to do. And so the question about whether it would actually be implemented, I think, just depends on what level of pressure is put on on presidents um, to to take the risk. And so let, let's play out for a second. Let's say there's a court case, and you know, uh, some conservative group or someone uh, or a student lender or something opposes it, or servicer. Um, aren't wouldn't you have a tremendous like unscramble the eggs? situation where you just promise all these people you're going to stand cancel you know cancel their debt like how how do you you know how do you unscramble the eggs in that sense i mean it, and also like uh, you know from a political standpoint you know you'd be the you know you'd be a judge that ends up being you know remembered for uncanceling everyone's student debt i mean it just seems like a it, it seems hard to, uh, you know, it, to your point, once you, if you're willing, if the president is willing to expend the political capital, it actually seems pretty difficult to take, you know, put them back, put, you know, put that debt back, back in place and make people, make them collect it. So I think that's right. I mean, what I would say is that um, the nature of that pressure is going to depend on, so one, can you get a court, can you prevent a, a president from doing it, right? So because because the unscrambled eggs problem is much worse if the debt's already been canceled. Because then it's not just 
I'm going to prevent the administration from doing it. It's I'm going to reimpose debt on people who have now just had their debt canceled and know who to attribute that to, right? There's a there's you know, this is, you know, the 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 president who made this decision to cancel tens of millions of people's debts whose lives are now suddenly much easier and better. Um and uh and they know who to attribute that to, and now they're going to know who to attribute it to. Who's going to make their put the put the debt back on them? Now, there's there's actually a set of questions about whether that would be the right level of relief. Would the debt be reimposed? And if that's the case, you know, great, take the loss in court and, and don't reimpose the debt. But so anyway, on the other hand, if somebody could get a court challenge in before the before all the administrative stuff could get in line to you know when it becomes clear that the president's going to do it, but you know, they're still trying to get the FELP loans and they're still convincing colleges and they're still, you know, figuring out the tax stuff. Um, uh, th it seems like it's easy, like th the judiciary is ideologically opposed, likely to be ideologically opposed to this enough. I mean, whether that is overcomes the legal arguments that um, you at least some, some judges are willing to take a risk. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's a, uh, well oh, first question here. <laughs> Yeah, so just to just to get the question on the mic. Uh, question is: Is it really expending political capital if it's politically ma really beneficial to the person doing it? Um, and I guess this is kind of getting in the head of the presidential candidates and stuff. But what's your take on so that? So, so I mean, I actually make that exact argument in the law review article. Uh, so I guess what I meant by political capital, and I was speaking loosely, is that. I mean, really, it's going to take, it takes time and effort, right? So when you have a so certain number of things to do, the qu you know, I mean, I guess, you know, obviously you can do multiple things at once, um, but, you know, coordinating, coordinating the administrative process to make this happen is going to have to happen at the same time as coordinating the administrative process to do, you know, to change the healthcare system, to negotiate with drug companies, et cetera, et cetera. I would, I, just I to follow I up, uh, to yeah. follow up at this point, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, yeah, it does go to this point where the political problem that you have is being a candidate where you've promised that you're going to cancel everyone's debt and then not doing it. Then 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 those people are really they're really going to be upset. I mean, those are they're not going to forget. Right. They're going to be like, get a bill and say, what the hell? Oh, yeah. What's going on here? Um, but just to get back to this question, because it's like about feasibility for a second, or just kind of the difficulty in the political capital. I mean, this is one of the very few things, given that it's with legally prosecutorial discretion and 90, 85% of it or whatever, a huge percent of it happens, it could be happen day one, I'm canceling your student debt, boom, it's gone. I mean, it's too late, you know? So uh, this is much different than something that does require rulemaking, although you have in your, your paper that you could do rulemaking to kind of ease it a little bit in some respects, right? You don't ne not necessarily need that, but um, this seems to be actually a lot easier than a lot of the other stuff. I mean, uh, the American Prospect did a great piece on, uh, you know, on this with an interview with you, and uh, they had a lot of other things on their day one agenda. Um, a lot of those do take rulemaking. They take a lot of creativity. They're actually much more, you know, uh, legally difficult to uh, bring about. This one is unique in that the prosecutorial discretion changes the difficulty level a little bit. Or am I, or am I thinking about that wrong? You mean the the like this number of steps that would yeah. be required? I mean. Because uh, once the president says IRS, DOJ, get on the same page, once they say that, it is effectively uh, done unless you get an ins uh, you know, uh, a disagreeable DOJ or uh, IRS person, which right. could happen. That's a, the, yeah. the, but then it's like, why did you appoint them? But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, 
Right. No, I, I, in that sense, I think that's right. And I think actually the most beneficial way to do it would be as fast as possible. Because because then you prevent a court then you prevent a court challenge from developing before it happens. Then the benefit happens. Um, uh, uh, you know, so like that's why doing thinking about the legal stuff in advance and really trying to figure out what all the what all the angles and where the limits are going to be, such that you're ready on day one or you know day ten to to really put it into place, um, is to me is a decisive uh, difference between you know taking a long time to. Maybe it's a reason, you know, and, and that's then you can get into the details of well, like, okay, which sorts of how do you prioritize which debts? I mean, that might be a reason to just say, okay, we'll do it for direct loans to start, and then we can, you know, meanwhile, we'll work on getting FELP loans or we'll create some sort of easy consolidation process, or we'll, you know, there's a whole number of different things that you could do um, to act creatively on those, but maybe you could start with one and then you, know, you get the ball rolling. And uh, we've got some more questions. Uh, yeah, audience member over here. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Patrick Haynes. I've recently graduated from American University with an excellent health administration at about $150,000 in debt. Uh, and one of the big questions I have is, is that we talk about it, uh, and there's a lot of problems that people have with things like, like we're, we're, we relieve everybody's debt, but that's not going to solve the problem. I mean, and one of the things is we have, you know, a lot of jobs that are not filled that are high skill technical jobs that don't need a college degree. Uh, we have a lot of people who have college degrees, but they're under. Uh, I want to know what, in this argument that we're having about college debt, do we need to talk about how people have been misled that, you know, college degrees are what you need to get ahead in life, and that we have a lot of people, uh, and that, you know, in this conversation, we need to talk about, you know, moving our economy away from people thinking that they need a college degree, because there's too many people looking for white-collar jobs, and not enough people filling jobs they don't need to go to college, and as a result, they're racking up debt they don't need. Uh, and what kind of conversation... Uh, where does that uh, where does that come in this conversation? I mean, you know, talking about you know the whole the situation of like people getting debt that they don't need and it's not economically feasible. So just to reiterate the question, the question is uh, uh, about. Uh, people may have been misled here. Maybe they took out a lot of debt that they didn't need to take out to get specific jobs. Um, how does that? How does that factor in uh, to this, to your paper and what you found? So to me, this is one of the really truly pernicious things about student debt is that that's the way that the question is asked, right? You know, people are getting, people are taking on debt that is gonna make their lives bad in a whole number of ways because, you know, because they think they need it to get a job. Where to me, um, so, the, and the reason that's pernicious is that, that what that does is it frames the whole purpose of getting a college degree, the whole purpose of getting an education as being able to work and make money. And, and that goes against a whole number of reasons that you would want to have a higher education system that's easily accessible to people, including um, training people in critical thinking, you know, being able to have conversations across difference, um, creating spaces for research and free thinking that are not subject to profit motives or to political motives, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, so the way I see it as fitting into the conversation is that when you start canceling student debt and when you start taking seriously the possibility that, that of making college free, truly free and accessible to everybody, um, you, you change what the conversation is about college. Then the problem, then the question isn't, do people need a college degree to get high skilled work uh, maybe maybe not i mean for some jobs you do for some jobs you don't but there's a whole other a whole number of other reasons that we want people and that people do want and and or ought to want to go to get a college degree and to learn you know complex skills for a complex world if you will um so so to me like attack so pointing out the illegitimacy part of pointing out the illegitimacy of student debt part of pointing out the reasons to cancel student debt is to start having that sort of conversation because you know, when you start to have that sort of conversation, it becomes much harder to say things like, well, you know, if people get a good job, then they can pay off their student debt. What's the problem? You know, there's a whole number of problems. They, they, choo they choose their job in part because of the amount of debt they take on, the set of decisions that they made about where, what sort of degree to get, right? It's, it's, a, it's the wrong way to organize society in a, in a deep way. Um, and that's not, and hopefully that's the sort of conversation that people start to have. But when it's framed, when student debt is framed as purely like, well, what debt is, is a, is a 
is, uh, you know, purely a balance sheet question, right? What are your assets and liabilities, and what's your, you know, what's your net worth, and that's how we measure welfare. Th then that's I, to me that's the wrong set of conversations to be having because it's not really like the value of a college degree is not just what can you get in on a, in the job market for it. Oh, and it's interesting there are like degrees of being misled because like you're there's like the the whole problem with the for profit college industry or something like the the more pernicious aspect of a predatory aspect is like you're actively being lied to. I mean, you are not going to get a job. You are not getting a good education that's worth anything approaching this amount. All the way to just the the structure of the system, right? That, that, that's like the extreme, but then there's just the structure of the whole thing, right? Well, and, but this is one of the reasons that the, that so you know when we're advocating for debt cancellation for for-profit college students, the nature of the legal argument is that somebody's it's like a consumer fraud violation, right? And and the limit of that way of talking about things, and the reason that we never talked about we talked about that as like the nature of the law, but the reason that when we were organizing folks and we were talking with folks about why it was a problem that for-profit colleges that they have this debt and don't have a job, um, is was not you know yes it's bad it's bad that you're lied to, but like there's a structure that makes it first of all possible to lie to people, um, and the and and there's a whole set of assumptions that one has to accept in order for it to be possible to set up a, a program that where the lie that you're going to get a job for this degree matters. Th so that's a whole bunch of a set of decisions about industrial policy, about what skills you need for what work, about which work pays what, about um, which schools are funded to teach which skills that leave the opening for the possibility that schools like this can enter the market and take advantage of what are already structural inequalities. So so the way that we always talked about what the problem with for-profit colleges was, was it's like an extreme version of this move of colleges towards only teaching people the narrow set of skills and financializing, et cetera, et cetera, rather than, well, they're just the bad, they're the bad apples, and what they do is delegitimize the whole system that's otherwise legitimate, where we're just going to allow people to take on a whole lot of debt and to, to get the you know, the people who have the right skills, they'll get the jobs and then it's all working just fine um, because the because the, the marketplace rewards skills, you know, in the proper way. Um, whereas, you know, that is not in fact how it works. And then if you if you see that's not how it works, then it's a different type of problem to have for profit colleges. And we talked about the political benefit a little bit and the polling is good, but and, uh, you know, people are going to get money. But. Um, I, you did. You spent a lot of time looking at economic studies and other ramifications of doing this. I mean, obviously, it would be. Uh, I mean, if they a, a big stimulus, you'd be putting cash in a lot of people's pocket. Um, you wrote about household formation, or that was that was something mentioned in one of the studies that you cite. Um, what are the economic benefits uh, that we would see? Um, and also, you know, there's been a history of uh, generous education programs in this country. I mean, the GI Bill, for one. What was the political response there? I mean, I'm, I haven't read it yet, but there's this, uh, you know, this uh, book about how the GI Bill led to, you know, uh, much more active, informed citizenry for the, the people that came back and uh, from war and were able to benefit from that. I mean, do you see the same type of parallels here or what you know what have you learned about kind of the history of these types of um programs uh, generous education spending programs like okay so well with respect to student debt in particular so there's this the, the, a couple of macroeconomists or a, more than a couple few macroeconomists put together this you know macroeconomic facts of canceling student debt and they assume that you're going to cancel all of student debt and i uh, unfortunately don't have the numbers memorized and can't rattle them off but basically you get um, you know, the stimulus effect, I think, is like uh, there's a two times uh, on, th on the model they use, which is like a, rel a relatively standard macro model. You get a, um, you know, the multiplier is, I think, 1.9, the, the Keynesian fiscal multiplier, um, the, the effect on employment. So, so in addition, right, so let's put this in more concrete terms. In addition to the fact that people now have, as it were, money in their pocket, which, which really means is non-debts, so they can now they can pay down other debts, right, and they can re remove those obligations from the, their lives. Um, they can um, they can make spending decisions in a different way without having to have a you know like their, the budget is like in any given month you don't have whatever it is the thousand dollar liability that goes to Sally May or Navient now. Um, Okay, so where does that money? You know, now that you, where does that money go? You can make that. So that's not you don't have money in your pocket in that way, but 
in effect you do. Um, and that changes the way people, as you say, people decide. So I've, I, can't, I can't count on my hands the number of people I've talked to who haven't settled down because they don't, because they have debt, because they don't want to burden other people with that. They don't have kids. They don't, right? So there's a whole n- number of set of questions about people being able to make decisions about their own lives that's not now being affected by student debt. So those are like direct, and you can trace that, right? People's families help them finance higher education, and now that student debt is canceled, maybe they can pay back their family members, and that helps their family. And also, you know, maybe they had co-signers, and now the co-signers don't have to be worried, and maybe because they had student debt, they're living with their parents, and now they can, you know, so there's a whole lot, there's, you can sort of trace that out within a family, and within friend networks, and within neighborhoods. Um, but in addition to that, the, the, the macroeconomic stimulus effect is that through the, as the channel of now that people have more purchasing power, when they go out and spend that money, that encourages more investment in business, which then in- increases employment, which then m- might raise the bargaining power of workers, which then, then have a knock-on effect on, on making life better for a whole lot of people, whether or not they had student debt, whether or not there's a direct effect, you know, in terms of somebody has money and now their life is better around them, right? Now, through the, as channeled through the... Um, the, 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 the macro economy, as it were, people are employed, there's more work to do, and maybe now we can start, there's, there's, you might say there's fiscal space to determine what sort of, where we should invest that money, who should be employed to do what. Um, we can s- ask different sets of questions. Um, with respect to the history of student lending and the generosity of the programs, I, I mean, uh, I'll sort of answer the question sideways and you can see if this is satisfactory. You know, one of the interesting things about the history, so. So when did opposition to free public higher education begin? Well, you really, so there was always some hesitation in Congress about whether the federal government should be responsible for funding higher education, either directly or by funding colleges. For most of, at least until the 1960s, the main idea was that you would have the federal government finance colleges. So in fact, uh, I talk about this in the paper a bit. It's There's this fascinating Truman put together this commission on like what higher education should look like. And there's a multi-volume report that they put together where they it just like this vision, they, in a very detailed way, they were like, here are all the benefits of making higher education free and universally accessible, and here's how he would do it, and here's the gaps that you would have to fill. And in fact, they, they were, it was progressive in a whole number of ways. They talked about doing affirmative action. This is in the 40s, right? They talked about doing affirmative action. They talked about ending gender discrimination. They, they, so there's a whole very interesting vision that was like available and possible and taken seriously by the President of the United States in, in the 1940s um, that was like compromised over basically by people who had, you know, their, their fiscal worries. And they had, actually, there was this whole thing about Catholics who didn't want the federal government to subsidize, to make higher education because then you don't have parochial schools and so then you don't have this same space to reproduce the religious hierarchy. I'm sorry, do I sound too negative about that? (laughs) And then, um, but there's also, there's also the dynamics of racial discrimination. So there's some, there was some that was like, well, we shouldn't have, um, we shouldn't subsidize schools that we know will discriminate. And then there was the other side, which is like, well, if we have the federal government financing that, they're going to create standards to make it such that that such that we can't discriminate if you're a Southern you know, Democrat, then you don't want that to happen. Um, you want to maintain white supremacy. Um, so there, those are a set of the debates that sort of led to the compromise of student debt. But the other set of things that was happening, the sort of actively we shouldn't have public higher education, was originally Ronald Reagan's campaign for governor of California in the 1960s. What did he, and what did he run against? Why did he run against free public higher education? It was precisely because, as you say, people are more critical thinkers when they go to college. And there was so much campus unrest. And there was, right, and it was just like, it was the idea that, that now you have these people who are ungrateful to our society and who are criticizing you know, our free enterprise system. And um, you know, they're dirty and they don't follow our norm. You know, there's a whole number set of other things. And also, this is a time when you're starting to get more, I, only the beginnings of a more diverse, um, and later in the 60s, that becomes much more diverse um, s- group of people who are now admitted into institutions of higher education. Um, and so, so the, the opposition, the sort of outright opposition to this is, is actively an opposition to like developing critical thinkers. Um, and actually, um, there's some neoliberal thinkers like, uh, like Milton Friedman and who talk about this sort of thing from less of a, you know, rile up the base perspective and more, well, you know, you probably want people, you probably... They're harder to dupe. 
you want people to, f you know, market signals should be should should more um, should be stronger, right? So people should take on debt to finance their education because then they're going to be thinking about well, how does this how is this useful for me on the job market? And of course, the justification for why that would be is that well, the market is sending the signals for what sort of skills we need for the economy. You have to have a certain view of how the economy works for that to mean something. But but that's the notion. It's like so now when people are financing their higher education, now they're going to sort of internalize the cost to society and the relative benefits of society of studying certain things. And so these were the, that's the set of, now whether those are the, there's a complicated story about what, if that actually guided policy towards student debt is like a little less, the, the increase of student debt was a little bit more of just like negligence and like, well, okay, this, we can't really like, neither side won the sort of detente as it were. Um, but as student debt became more entrenched in society, these ways of thinking about what the, about the role of higher education in life and conservatism in general became more prominent. So in, in the 90s, when student debt really, really starts to take off, this notion of, of the natural, like stu student debt as sort of natural part of life suddenly becomes uh, part of the conversation. Just people start talking about college as an investment, be in part because they have student, and, you know, it, it sort of acts exactly as Friedman predicts. That kind of gets me to the question of, is this a unique political moment for this in that most people who engage in politics, I mean, they're disillusioned because like nothing good comes of it, right? They, they, they experience uh, the, a Democrat, a Republican, their health care costs go up, uh, their jobs are worse, their pay is stagnant, um, uh, you know, their debt is increased. Uh, I mean, you don't see uh, very many things that are good happening to you as a result of a political process. And this would be ostensibly one that would be, I mean, pretty tangible for a lot of people. Does that make it any more or less, you know, important from a political standpoint? I mean, I just think obviously, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, um, <laughs> so it, it's sort of weird to see, to have to be a, uh, argued against in Jacobin, but there's this article in Jacobin that's, that, that responds sort of directly to these set of arguments that I'm making, and they say, and the, so the, the nature of the argument is, well, okay, if you're looking for ways to, to use presidential power to basically do what Congress ought to be doing, right, there's more democratic legitimacy. I mean, we can question those assumptions, but um, then you're not doing the real hard work of power building, right? What you're doing is you're, you're, you're doing what Basically, the, the sort of new Democrats and neoliberal Democrats, however you want to refer to them, have been doing for a long time, which is like, look, we got this whole set of experts. We got these lawyers that know how to do how to navigate the process. We'll get basically everything that you want without having to think about, you know, winning seats in Texas. Um, and I think it's and I think this is for just for the reason that you just articulated. That's a false dichotomy. So I think that's right. We shouldn't be just look, looking for ways to, you know, solve the immigration impasse, for instance, just by doing DACA and DAPA, although I think those were the right things to do, and there should have been much more. I mean, there's much more that Obama could do. Um, but uh, if you think about the use of presidential power and the benefits that could be won through the use of presidential power, particularly in this case, but you can also do it more broadly, as a way to build, to, to show tangible gains to, in this case, a particular party in power or a particular ideological formation. And so first of all, you make people's lives better. You can point to something that you've done and you can point to what you can, you can then mobilize people around. Hey, you know, first of all, if you lose in court, now you say, well, I tried to do this. Like we need to get people, you know, you can mobilize people and there are people organizing around student debt that who will do that organizing. Um, but as you start to move to use presidential power in creative ways, you do, you are interacting with um, people not just in providing them benefits, but also in providing them reasons to buy into a political system, and particularly your approach to a political system that can like win longer term victories. And I want to open it back up to the audience. We've got the same two people. Let's go back to Randy. So the question is, have I looked into the, the reason that tuition has grown so much and does it have to do with the existence of student debt? So, so I have looked into it, whether I would portray myself as somebody who can um, navigate through the studies and say something definitive, 
I would be a little bit more tenuous about that. My understanding about the nature of the literature is that the, the fact of student debt does seem to have something to do with it. The main, there's like this main underlying dynamic called the cost, Baumol's cost disease, with the, the thesis of which is that, you know, as, um, as an economy becomes more uh, efficient, not in the neoclassical economic sense, but in the sense of that costs of inputs are reduced through technological innovation and, pr and changes in production processes and suppression of worker wages and you know, a whole number of ways, the relative cost of, of things like education or things like orchestras um, becomes higher or because there's not, you're not, there's not more efficient orchestras, right? You still need the same number of people and they still play for the same number of time, right? And similarly for education, I mean, this is one of the reasons you know, the, the, the solution for this is online, ed, massive online education where you only have a few people teaching and you can lo lower the cost and all you have to pay for is, you know, the environmental cost of the, of the you know, the, the electronic infrastructure and whatever. Um, so, but anyway, that's, that does, that's a real reason, I think, for the growth and that's just sort of like the cost, whether that, but, so that doesn't answer the question of whether that cost is borne by students or not, right? That just means like the co somebody who pays that cost the relative cost is higher. Um, so like the fact of state of like state divestment in higher education, especially starting in the in the 90s, and it's not so much divestment as it is, it's not so much reducing the absolute amount, but reducing the relative amount that goes to public higher, higher education. Um, in other words, that the expanding, the expanding enrollment, the spending stays the same while expanding enrollment keeps growing. Um, is it one, it's a one reason, um, but, so that that would make more of that sort of secular change in cost then be passed on to to individuals, um, whether they take on debt to finance that or otherwise. But the sort of question, the dynamic that you're asking about, I think, is whether the fact that people don't have to pay for their own education this is sort of like a moral hazard type story. The fact that people don't have to don't immediately bear the cost of their own education, they might not. They might just be willing. And so that sort of argument would also apply to voucher, right? Pell grants and vouchers and sort of things. Um, my understanding is that ed that evidence for that is mixed, and uh, that it does seem that student debt has more of that effect than than Pell grants. Um, interestingly, um, and so so the the story is not quite as straightforward as as that. I don't I haven't seen I don't think there's been enough like careful research on that. Um, uh, but I do think there is a when you think about. Um, competition is not on cost in higher education usually. Um, and in a lot of ways that's a good thing, but competition also isn't usually on quality, it's on s things like status and, and like how do you do in the, the world, US world news rankings. Um, so anyway, that's a very long and complicated and not really a non-responsive answer. My understanding is that basically it does seem to have some sort of role. It's not the really main driving factor, the fact of financing higher education through student debt um, and, and, and switching the financing through direct financing to colleges would allow, so sorry, just to briefly elaborate, one reason that financing higher education through debt would, might be a problem is that, in, in, in this sense, is that you don't have any control over what the funds are used for. Now, of course, too much control over what the funds are used for means that the state's now controlling what people learn, right? That you don't want that. But, you know, when you're when 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 education is not subsidized in the same way, one of the things that happens is other forms of financialization. So namely schools take on debt to build buildings, to build fancy dorms, to build um, student centers. So like the clearest example of this is Cooper Union. Do folks know about the Cooper Union story? So Cooper Union has been free, and I think is still free. No, I think they, well, anyway. Cooper Union is an art school that's supposed to be, that was, that there was a money that this land was given. So the Cooper owns the land under the Empire State Building. And so all of that, like that money goes to fund Cooper Union, which is like arts education for working class people. Um, and what Cooper Union did was they basically like took on a bunch of debt to finance a new student center that nobody but nobody wanted, but the the new dean decided to do it, um, in part for vanity reasons, in part because somebody on the board of direct, you know, people can make money off of it. And so that's a way that then suddenly now the question of free tuition in Cooper Union is in question, right? And there's a whole lot of protests around that, and I I can't remember what the current equilibrium is, but that the writ large. 
um, if you don't, so Cooper Union is a place that was free, right? And in part, that's like Cooper Union experienced the effects of what's going on elsewhere. But if you have a space where you have to figure out how to finance college, including through student debt, um, where you have to go to donors for money, where you have to find financing for buildings, because people are only going to finance things that can be that are sort of capital expenditures in the sense that you can pr provide show returns, right? You're not going to really finance a professorship, right? You're not going to take out a loan to finance a new chair. Um, uh, changes the way that administration works, such that the cost of the, the cost that go, is passed on to then individual students is more. Right? So that's like a somewhat less direct story for why student debt might have that effect. There are also a lot of student. There are a lot of people. I mean, it's a, a lot of employees with healthcare benefits, and there's a bit of a mirroring of you know all those healthcare costs go up for all those workers, and the cost of the whole thing goes up. I mean, that doesn't explain all of it, but the, it's some you know it, that's I think part of the story, at least from what I, some of the stuff that I've looked at, but just to stay on this for a second, which is like the whole system and the whole structure and you're, you know, you're getting at the core of it or you're getting at this one, you know, side effect, which is that people end up with a lot of student debt. Um, now let's say day one, new president, we're canceling it all or I'm canceling $50,000 of everyone's debt. What does that do to the system? I mean, is that, cause everyone to have to come to the table and r go back to this Truman uh, conversation or at least have some kind of debate about what what do we want what is this system going to look like because it seems a little untenable that people just go to college and then you know they take out a bunch of debt and then they wait until it gets forgiven right um, I mean I know multinational corporations do that with their tax taxes but it, yeah um, I mean, it would be a wasted opportunity if that weren't the way, and that depends on how it's done, right? I mean, there's there's a couple, there's a number of different ways to do this, but there's n certainly nothing prevent nothing to prevent uh, uh, the next president from doing a true another Truman Commission, you know, appointing a bunch of people to say what should we do for higher education? Like, let's come up with some creative ideas, and let's have a big report, and let's like bring representatives from multiple parts of society, and you know, do the thing. Um, that could be paired with canceling student debt. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I don't want to make too many detailed sort of institutional predictions of what would happen, but I think w one sort of clear thing that would happen is that it just changes the, it changes the status quo immediately, such that the legitimation of the status quo, like legitimating the previous regime becomes h much more difficult because that's not the re current regime. And so the question of like, well, okay, now that we've canceled student debt, and all these people's lives are obviously better. Like, well, okay, how do we make more of that? And how do we, um, how do we deal with the fallout of this? Um, which is not, you know, how do we deal with the fact that like people aren't going to college anymore? Clearly, that wouldn't be the, the outcome, right? People are going to college with a different set of expectations and a different notion of what it means. Um, to me, that's like exactly the sort of thing that you should be channeling. Now we're opening up a set of questions. It's hard. I think it's. You can open up that set of questions, but it's harder to open up that set of questions if you don't change the status quo, at least in some way, right? Canceling all students would be a big way, right? But, but good. And uh, we got some more questions. We got th three more. One, two, three. Well, who who wouldn't lend? But the, the, these are direct loans from the government. I mean, so some existing loans are in the hands of private lenders. So it's first of all, there is this whole private student debt, but that's, that's actually a, a pretty small. That's like five percent of outstanding student debt. But that wouldn't that and wouldn't you? They couldn't. The, no, they couldn't the do the that. The proposal right. says you can't actually address private student loans. Sorry, not through this mechanism, right? But but that, to the point. I mean, the point is both.
Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the loan, yeah. It, it, I don't think that would happen just because the loan programs wouldn't have been changed overnight or the amount that you could take out in student debt. So that you, you still wouldn't be able to pay. Right? Your, your, your amount of federal, bar, the amount that the student could take out in student debt is still going to be set. So, so we had, so we already, I, I want to turn this into a longer, a, a different question since we already had a long conversation about how they're correlated or not. But there is going to be a sort of pushback here, which we've already seen, which is uh, from uh, Moody's uh, economist, uh, I'm blanking on his name. Ozemek? Uh, so, yeah. yeah. About, oh, this is moral hazard, you know, um, this is... Uh, not going to work. Um, this is not going to be very good for the economy. Um, what's the evidence of, of, of that? Oh, it's going to lead to increased interest rates because uh, it's uh, inflationary and um, you know too much uh, government debt, uh, or you know is not going to be paid back. Uh, What's your what's your response to that? What's the evidence that that type of uh, art, line of reasoning is uh, carries or, you know uh, is useful? So there's a there's a lot of different claims in there, but I mean, I, so the the nature of the moral hazard claim. <clears throat> so so I think of the moral hazard claim is cashed out roughly in the way that we just heard, which is that well, the moral hazard would be on institution on on you know Yale or whatever you know, or, you know, more likely like, um, you know, University of Phoenix. Um, uh, I think there's a plausible story there, but there are limits in the system to how much debt can go out. So there are sort of checks on that. And also there's a whole number of ways to reform, even with that, right, there's a whole number of ways to prevent more for-profit colleges from getting money without congressional action. Um, there's a whole number of crackdowns that can happen there. Um, but so let's take for granted that some checks are in there, but there would be some reason for colleges to raise tuition as certainly as much as they could if they thought there was going to be an ongoing process of debt cancellation without any other changes, which doesn't, which maybe would be the status quo for some period of time, although there would be this question about how you deal with it. Um, but the, the, the nature of the moral hazard claim is often directed at individuals, at students. And it, to me, the question is, what's the moral hazard? That you get, a, you get education? That you get more education? And that's a problem. I mean, the, uh, you know, the cash out the problem, there would have to be some story about, well, you know, the, the current system is priced in the exact right way such that people who, you know, only the people who wouldn't, who would contribute more by getting an education and then working with that education do that. And everyone else, and, you know, everyone else has the right incentives to work because they would make more money that way. And the amount of money they make reflects the amount of productivity and other thing, good things they do for society, such that if you change the balance of incentives and more people go to college, that's going to be, a pro you know, that's actually a harm to all of us. There's no free lunch or whatever. And, and like, that's just, like, set a whole set of, like, highly implausible and, in fact, empirically, I think, very suspect assumptions about how higher education works and what the trade-offs are. To me, it's a good thing if more people feel like they can go to school and learn things that they want to learn. You don't go to school. I mean, so I guess there's a world in which people start going to school and get their educations paid for and don't go to class and just, you know, party all the time. I, it just doesn't seem to how, be how things happen and how people make decisions about whether they want to go to school. There's a whole number of other reasons not to go to school. So it seems to me that that's a good thing, that more people would go to school, and that moral hazard's a weird sort of claim. There's a whole set of claims about inflation that we can talk about. I, I, the macroeconomic model is, addresses the possibility of inflation, at least with a one-time form of get, debt cancellation. It shows that the inflationary effects would be very small. The nature of the inflationary effects would depend on a whole number of other things, namely what other what other how investment is going in the economy overall, what other macroeconomic programs and fiscal programs are being done, what the, what the structure of the tax rates are, you know, and, and those are, um, you know, but holding them fixed, it's, it wouldn't be inflationary. I think we can just pretty safely say. Okay, second question, and then we had another question over here.
one teacher for public service, uh, whether that's the military, Peace Corps, volunteering. That I, I have heard about that as a possible uh, you know way to provide ec you know economic and other higher other utility um, to to make it worthwhile not just for them to gain an outside experience, but also you know helping you know with you know some other benefit. Uh, what do you think about that? Um. Uh. So I don't think, I mean, of course the question about whether there should be mandatory public service it does not inherently have to be connected to a higher education benefit, right? And so in some sense it's like, we're, it's like a sideways sort of, it's like not really what we're talking about. But so, and let me just elaborate on that a bit and then I can say maybe a bit about why I think that wouldn't be the right way to go about things. The reason I don't think it ought to be tied is that I don't think, I think the notion of I think that still reinforces the notion that, you know, somehow if you go to college financed by public funds, you're getting something for free if you don't give back in some way. And like the nature of what people do to give back and help each other is is not, you know, you don't have to do public service in order to give back. And a lot of people already give back in very, you know, very unequal variety of ways. Um, so I think it's better to treat to, for it to be a right, and it's not something that you that the government says, well, okay, we'll give you education, but you ought to do this. The question about whether you have to do mandatory public service seems to me a, a separate sort of question from whether education ought to be available as a right to a free people, because, and uh, to a free democratic people who wants to make decisions, who wants to have decisions broadly dispersed among the population, among an informed citizenry, right? Um, with respect to mandatory public service in general, I, the way I think about the the sort of spirit there is that well, what you want everybody to, you don't want people to do to everyone to work in finance, and in fact, probably you don't want that you don't want many people at all to work in finance, right? Because because that sector should mostly be displaced. But but how do you do that? That's not you don't do that through mandatory public service in the most effective way. What you do is. You, you structure industrial policy and public employment such that people have people can work, do good work. So you know a, a simple American example of this is the WPA, right? Which is it, it's an unemployment benefits program. But now you're saying, well, what work do we want people to do? Service work. I mean, people are you know in addition to like building important buildings and doing great public art, are are collecting folkways, are are doing oral histories, right? These those are all public service. So why don't we just pay people to do it? Um, so it seems to me that that's the same spirit, um, but you don't have to have this sort of weird moralized notion about what it means to give back to a, to a, the community. Last question over here. Hi, um, I'm Marjorie Brown. I'm sort of confused about here. <laughs> I'm the Red Cross. I actually Good to meet you in person. So just to uh, rephrase the two questions, first is, uh, would this result in more direct funding from the government if you cancel the student let the direct uh, tie between the government giving money to the schools? And second question, um, I think, I let me, I'm going to try to uh, rephrase it. If this gets challenged in court, 
what other kinds of impact would it have in terms of making other kind of prosecutorial discretion reviewable? Or is yeah, that, so the is way that, I understood the question the right? was, would there be perverse in co consequences of setting a precedent where an agency can start to use prosecutorial discretion to do relatively broad shifts in policy? Oh, okay. And where, what, what other agencies could suddenly do that? Yeah, and I, I actually uh, throw in, we do a lot on antitrust, which has a lot as where, like, I think some of the biggest prosecutorial discretion gets used. I mean, maybe that's relevant. I don't know. So, so I actually don't, I'd have to think more about the first question about how, because canceling public debt that's already financed by the federal government doesn't at least initially change the structure of where revenue, where colleges are getting revenues. <clears throat> whether that would, you know, whether and to what degree that would have some sort of dynamic effect that changed where colleges get their money. So it might be more in this, this moral hazard type way where now colleges are like, oh great, well we can, you know, students, we can not feel bad about having students take on student debt. And so we're just gonna like not fund a lot of things and you're not go to donor, you know, I mean, I, that would require like basically only this to happen and no other changes to happen and then like institutions to make a whole set of decisions and not run up against student loan limits, et cetera. Um, so that's my non-answer to that question. And that's my reason for not answering that question. And then um, the, the question of the perverse effects of prosecutorial discretion, I think it's worth um, thinking carefully about what how, what exactly those might be because, so things like having a more aggressive immigration policy um, already, that is already happening. Um, and in fact, the form of prosecutorial discretion that would be relevant there is DAC, DACA and DAPA were forms of enforcement discretion. And, and that's like the, the Fifth Circuit Court decision that struck down DAPA and the Supreme Court's divided non-opinion, basically default approval of that is like the really main precedential threat that could be a problem for doing this sort of, it's not a direct, it's not direct precedent, the reasoning isn't directly applicable, but you could, that's a reason to think that there might be some resources, sort of legal resources out there. Um, but let's like, to be more directly responsive, um, so what is, so the re, I mean, one of the things that the court says in Heckler, and that maybe this alleviates your worries, is that one of the reasons that courts ought not to, um, have anything to say? So first, all right, so first of all, let me just say, like, prosecutorial discretion is routinely exercised with respect to antitrust yeah. in the SEC. Like, yeah. it's just like a part well, of the, the regular, I, right? Yeah, but, but this is a unique in that it's not enforcing, right? Like, they're already not enforcing a lot. They're already using prosecutorial discretion not to right. go after a bunch of violators in myriad ways. I right? mean, what what, it, what is different? <laughs> is that the nature of the claim is clear now that of course you still have to prove your claim in court but there's an existing there's a there's a promissory note right unlike with say an sec enforcement where you have to like establish whether there's liability <clears throat> but you know the the analogy there is like you know you got into a car accident i think maybe i used this example with you marcia you get into a car accident do you, okay are you going to sue the person are you going to bring a tort suit against the person well do you have a claim or not? It's still not determined, right? But but you make a set. Of, so that's the that's the sort of equivalent, an agency equivalent version of that, um, I, which I don't think is legally relevant. We can talk but about the, it more. But, the, but is there a I guess is there a difference between having the claim, having the explicit claim, and let's say you know the SEC, you know you, there's just clear evidence that a company is channel stuffing or doing something that's clearly illegal under the SEC. Uh, laws. So this is like what what is too big to jail? Yeah, or any that's what, any yeah that's it, what it it is. Just, yeah. It, so it, like it already happens, and, it, and big big businesses already take advantage of it all the time, and it's just like as part of everyday life. Um, in, yeah, this is just not novel. In that respect, it doesn't seem novel. I mean, it just seems that it's novel in that it's being applied to this specific area, which they don't tend to. I mean, use right, it. and it's. <clears throat> It undermines, I mean, depending on how broadly it's done, it undermines the whole program, right? And so that's, a, there's, a, there's a set of like an affirmative benefit that's being provided <coughs> that like now the nature of the benefit changes. But uh, like, so what, but like, so we, so what I'm saying is like, it requires a little bit more work to think about what the perverse possibilities are. Like, you know, non-enforcement of environmental laws, right? Non-enforcement of, 
um, you know, uh, murder laws. I mean, you know, th th these are those are the sorts of things that would be acquired. And like, so, so one, the sort of thing that the court says in Heckler is, the sort of constitutional level argument is, well, right, there's political structures of accountability for those sorts of things. And like, it's just not up to courts to do that determination. And another thing that Heckler says, and this might provide a reason for a court to differentiate some forms of prosecutor discretion from others, although uh, it hasn't really been litigated, is that you know, one of the reasons that we defer to agencies to make these decisions is that unlike in cases where courts are called in to protect individual rights as against the state, where the state is enforcing something against somebody, this is a case where the state is saying, we're not going to enforce against you, right? And, and so there's not, there's not the same call for a court to step in between two people and say, can you do that or not? The, the state's saying, well, I could do it, but I'm not gonna, we're not going to get into the legal question. And so with respect to something like environmental law, there might be a more complicated analysis there, right? Because it's not, you know, yes, it's the state enforcing a claim maybe against a polluter, but the nature of the harm the state is protecting other people might be a slightly different set of reasons. You might have a different set of reasons to say that court should protect interest. You should have a, another branch of the government have something to say about that discretion. Now, I'm not... I'm not going to go in. I'm not going to say that that's the right answer, but that might be a sort of way to that a court might differentiate. I got one last question. I think we'll wrap up. Um, so, getting back to the economics, right? Like, this is actually really good for certain industries, like uh, housing industry, anything related to the housing industry. I imagine more people to buy cars or lease cars. Uh, yeah, the construction industry. Uh, if I'm a realtor lobbyist or a real estate lobbyist, I'm, I'm putting you on speed dial. I mean, are you getting any uh, inquiries from all these people that ostensibly would benefit from the... Uh, uh, no, I, no? I, I, I don't okay. know if anybody thinks it's feasible enough yet or they're not pricing it into their model. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't I know. Mean, the Maybe the real estate industry is not that creative. I, I mean, the president's paying attention. I mean, the, at least as far as that article. And he is, is a representative of the real estate industry yeah, is what you're saying. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, well, thank you so much for doing this. It was a really great conversation. Thanks to everyone coming out. And we are going to do a, a happy hour after this. If uh, anyone wants free drinks, you're more than welcome to join us. Where, where are we doing that? Uh, well, TBD, but thanks again for everyone for coming. And uh, please give Luca a round of applause.